pressure continues to be normal. I think the table pressure looks good. Traveling up. Water towers can fly! Ego down to nominal. Why the top side of feed off? Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these. Well, good morning from the Kennedy Space Center press conference. Uh, we're or press conference press site off to a great start there. Uh, we're bringing you live coverage of the start of the launch countdown for Artemis one ahead of this very historic weekend. Um, now we're here at the press site. We got SLS in the background and the countdown clock in the foreground. We're going to be watching um, live as NASA starts the countdown for the flight. Uh, we're going to go into what that means, why this is important. Uh, but first, I want to give an a introduction to who is here with me. Uh, now we have in the studio, Philip Sloss. Uh, no one has written more words about SLS than he has or ever has. Uh, how's it going, Philip? Good. Starting to get exciting. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, starting to feel real. And uh, also out here in the field providing uh, this video coverage, uh, Chris Gebhardt, Assistant Managing Editor with NASA Spaceflight. How's it going out there, Chris? Oh, okay. Well, so like my excitement level is through the roof. Like this has been amazing the last few days. And like she's on the pad and we're about to be in countdown operations on launch pad B for the first time since October of 2009. Good day. Good day. Absolutely. Now, as always, with all of our live streams, these are very interactive. We love hearing your comments, your questions in chat. Um, we're going to be going through as many as we can uh, in between covering all the events uh, in this live stream here. Uh, but Chris, you kind of stole some words out of my mouth there. Uh, I kind of actually wanted to go into that. So you've been following SLS now for probably about a decade, if not more. And what's it like now to finally be there at the press site? They're about to start the launch countdown yep. and SLS is on the pad. What's going through your head right now? Yeah. So what's going through my head is one pinch me. It's real. Like we're <laughs> actually here. Like the launch countdown is about to begin for this mission. The other things going through my head are like bringing this all to fruition. You know, this is a program that for the Artemis program that really and honestly truly started with the Constellation program in January of 2004 with the George W. Bush administration. And during that program, there was going to be a crew launch vehicle and then a cargo vehicle. And there was this weird and there was this plan too for a, a mix and match vehicle. And that is what you see here on the pad that was retained from the Constellation program, the twin five segment solid rocket boosters, the RS 25s, the overall sort of design of SLS is very similar. You can definitely see how they took that from Constellation. So in many ways, it hasn't just been the 11 years since the formal approval of the SLS rocket, um, about a, which happened about a month after the conclusion of the shuttle program um, in September of 2011. It, it, it's really been a bit longer than that for the overall design of some of the elements that are incorporated onto this vehicle. And to see it here on the launch pad, to be talking to all of the teams who have poured more than a decade into designing and building this vehicle, the excitement is palpable. Like there's that, there's that thing, that indescribable thing in the air where everyone is just rooting to have a very happy, empty launch pad at 10.33 a.m. on Monday morning. Absolutely. And that's what I'm looking forward to. Um, and Philip, I'm actually going to ask you the same question. So you said that you're very excited too, and you've been covering SLS extensively uh, for the past about decade, pretty much. What are your thoughts now seeing the camera view we have right now as the countdown is about to start? What's going through your mind? Well, I was actually looking at the the uh, the feed that uh, NASA is providing from the uh, east looking west and one of the things that struck me this morning is th the vehicle is is clean um it looks mm -hmm. this is the first time that it, it's looked like it's ready to fly and and it, because it is and uh so you know i i'm uh i'm definitely a details person and so i'm you know i i remember a lot of a lot of the details of this um especially over the last you know 8 years or so that i've been covering this and so um you know, it's one. I mean, it you, you can't you can't talk about this without talking about how it's it's you know there's definitely a, a feeling of it's finally ready to fly. Um, I know, you know, there you can talk about different dates on this, but uh, I think I don't know that there were a lot of people that thought it would take until now to get here. Um, but I think you know if if this if this 
flies successfully, I think most of that will be forgotten, kind of like what we saw with the uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. Great gotcha. way to put that. Yeah, it's exciting. It's taken a while, but we are here now. Uh, cool. Now that we got that out of the way, uh, Chris, do you kind of want to give us a bit of like a, an overview of what is happening in this live stream? So what is the countdown starting? What is this marking? Is it when the vehicle turns on? What are we, what are we looking at here? Yeah, yeah. And in many ways, exactly what you just said, Ian. Um, so this is the start of the absolute final preparation of the vehicle side to configure SLS for first up for propellant loading, which will pick up um, just after midnight on Monday morning, local time here at the Kennedy Space Center. But there's a lot that has to happen before that. So this is a 46 hour, 40 minute countdown. So just shy of 47 hours. It will take them just about, it will take them just about 46 hours and 40 minutes. Oh, sorry. The countdown clock, it's, it's 46 hours and 40 minutes from the moment the clock starts to the opening of the launch window. But there's about, there's, there, but there are some built-in holds in here. So the count will take a little bit long. So the numbers that will appear on the screen will be a little bit lower than 46 hours, 40 minutes, um, if that makes sense. Because there's the L minus time to launch and then the T minus time, which is the time on the clock. And those two things will not actually sync until we get to T minus 10 minutes and the terminal count begins because we do have some built-in holds. But basically, when the countdown begins, the first thing that they're going to do is uh, there's a sequence of events. Orion will be powered up. The ICPS will be powered up initially. The ICPS is the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage from United Launch Alliance, um, which is a modified version of the Delta IV's cryogenic second stage. Um, they will power that on initially to do avionics checkouts and software checkouts. And then when all of those are done, they'll actually power the ICPS back down because um, they don't need it powered up at the, after that point. Um, and they'll leave it powered down for about another nine hours and then actually power it up for flight at about 18 hours prior to liftoff. Uh, meanwhile, the core stage um, composite overwrap pressure vessels that hold the helium for the pressurization of the tanks to flight levels and during flight will be brought online and pressurized to flight levels. Um, they are already there. The, the helium is already in there. The boosters already have their hydrazine for their auxiliary power units. So that part of the fueling process has already taken place. Um, we've already seen the crew access arm be pulled back away from Orion, so that is out of the way um, and will not be moved at all during our count at all. But this is basically bringing the vehicle up, making sure all of the systems are coming online, are communicating with ground and air and satellites as intended, and really just getting everything ready for the start of fueling operations which is the start of the business end of the countdown, which is that is the moment that when the fuel is on board where we are actually fully configuring SLS to leave the pad on its own power and not under the power of the crawler transporter. Because as a few people said when she rolled out last week, don't bring her back. <laughs> yes. And uh, I'm going to be straight honest. What you said there, the countdown timeline that got me so excited because in my head, I'm like, okay, SLS is launching Monday. It just has not clicked that SLS is launching Monday. Yeah. And just hearing what you're saying, oh, they're starting to power up. They're moving the crew access arm away. They're powering up the ICPS. They're getting the ground stations ready. I'm like, this, this yeah. is really happening. We're yeah. Really and part about of to see this. Yeah. And part of those communication checks that you were talking about and, and was sort of the things that they walk through initially um, and then redo toward the end of the countdown to make sure all of those links are good. Uh, SLS has to be able to communicate through the ground lines to the launch control center. So they're testing that. It has to be able to communicate what's called ground to air, which is like a ground communication going to the actual receiving antennas on board SLS and vice versa. But then SLS also has to be able to communicate air to air. Once it leaves the ground, it needs mm -hmm. to be able to communicate not just back down to the Bermuda tracking station, which will be the primary tracking station through the first six minutes of flight. But after that, it needs to transition to talk up to the TDRS network for a large part of the final ascent into the initial parking orbit um, and everything. And, and then the ICPS needs to talk to TDRS. The Tracking and Data Relay Satellite Network from NASA is what TDRS stands for, because the TDRS is the big communications network that NASA has in geostationary orbit. So ICPS will be communicating through there during the vast majority of its part of the flight through translunar injection. So making sure all of those communication assets are up and running 
and that the rocket is communicating properly before you get to the final go no go pole just before 10 minutes is very important. So that's a large part of why the communication systems are also activated and checked out as well. Gotcha. And actually, you answered part of a question that I had queued right up here um, from a Al RK saying, which tracking stations will be involved? So you discussed Tedris and you discussed the uh, the ground connections. But after it leaves the launch pad, Chris, or after it leaves mm -hmm. the Tedris uh, connectivity, what's going to be talking to SLS? I love this stuff. question. Yeah, a, a lot, lot of stuff. Yep. Yeah. The the primary way that it will com that Orion and, and and by extension the European Service Module will communicate back to Earth once they pass the um, the 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 Tedris um, geostationary um, belt uh, altitude in 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 the orbit going out to the moon, it will then start to communicate through the deep space network. So it will communicate through Canberra, Madrid, and Goldstone. Very cool. Well, just to, but, but there's know, but there's a lot of other stuff watching it. Like that's the primary path that they'll get a lot down through. But there's a lot other a, a lot of other things that are communicating well, with this vehicle, right, Philip? Yeah. Let me let me. Just just to give you a sense of how complicated this is, um, during launch, the you're, there is a split between uh, orbital and deep space network assets and ground assets. And so the SLS, which the SLS has the ICPS, which is a which is a ULA product. Um, and then you have the core stage and boosters, which is the the elements that were developed in this, you know, we've been talking about the September 14th, 2011 official start of the SLS program. And so the core stage and the boosters are the main development of that. Those two assets kind of work together as one during launch, and those will be communicating only through the ground. The Tedris and the orbital assets will be communicating with Orion and ICPS because they're, they're in space. It's those that will be the in-space part of the mission. Um, for launch, there is a tracking station at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Uh, there's the Ponce de Leon Inlet Station that will be tracking the vehicle, and SLS will be streaming down um, both operational flight instrumentation and development flight instrumentation. And, and as Chris said, you've got um, that's mostly downlink of telemetry from the vehicle to the ground to be recorded. But then you also have the capability to uplink to the SLS in flight, so you've got the two-way communications if you need it. Um, and then, but and and the V and then core stage is also using GPS, but that's just purely for navigational purposes. Um, and then you get into again once core stage is done after about eight minutes and it separates, then it's uh, oh, I forgot. Then the the Bermuda station that that Chris was talking about, and so the core stage is going to be talking to Bermuda for ho for quite a while, hopefully, because after it shuts down, it still then needs to downlink all the video that it's going to record on board. It, it will be doing some streaming during live streaming during launch of possibly two views simultaneously, but there's there's I think close to a dozen cameras on the vehicle that will all be recorded and then they're going to downlink that after uh after the stage separates and, and orion and icps leave so yeah and and from what even, i was told at the media day at, at johnson earlier this month that that downlink is through tedros after core stage step yeah well we'll see uh it's it's the you know one of the things that the with, that happens with the course is it doesn't have an active attitude control system other than the the core stage engine. So once those shut down, it's 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 going to be it's just going to be kind of slowly building up rates as the as the uh, uh, cryogenic tanks they'll they'll relieve themselves if the pressure gets too high. So you have a vent valve on both the hydrogen and the oxygen tank, and when those vent, we used to see this with the with the external tank that will put. You know that can put roll pitch yaw moments on the vehicle, and so um, what I was told from uh, Marshall Space Flight Center is is that they're still hoping that those rates won't be so high that the communication system can't uh, maintain a lock ah. on Bermuda. Huh. Um, but ah, yeah, gotcha. at least from what I'm seeing, um, I mean there you have so many like you have three active vehicles um, um, that you're looking at. Um, on the on the launch pad, you've got the Orion spacecraft, you've got the ICPS, which is essentially an independent vehicle from the core stage bo and boosters and Orion. 
And so all three of those have their own communication system, have their own computer system, um, have their own you know data and telemetry systems. And so all, you you need to support all three of them um, during the initial part of flight. And then it you know as you as you move along, it gets more you know then you're you're you don't have the boosters, then you don't have the core stage, and you're down to Orion and ICPS, and then eventually just Orion. Gotcha. And yeah, the what you're saying there about just how complex the communication is, when I actually found out about their communication plan a few days ago, it really made a click in my head that everyone talks about, you know, how 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 tough it was make to make the core stage, how tough it was to make Orion. But also in the background, you have people working on software, working on planning for just this single mission. Like the amount of planning yep. that had to go into this over the past, literally the past decade, it just doesn't even register in my mind. And even just the well, communication path alone just shows how complex this mission is. And it's not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing, but it's just this requires that. And that just blows my mind. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and like right down to like some of the differences, like the core, um, like the core launch control, um, uh, the core command and control software systems for the launch control center. Um, the the sort of parts of the code that control the countdown that like the GLS the ground launch sequencer that sequences everything lives in basically um, the system. Um, this is th that that underlying software for the launch count is for Artemis one only, and some things they can port to Artemis two, but because Artemis two and beyond will start carrying crew, the whole underlying logic software. For the launch changes with artemis 2 going forward and they're about halfway through creating that base code for artemis 2 right now um and the base code the last time they changed the base code for what will be used tomorrow was after the second um oh philip what's it called t tsc tcs turn C CST, uh, CST, what is cst stand oh, oh for? the countdown okay. sequence test yeah countdown sequence was, test yes yeah that's, that's yeah. After I mean, they that, did the second one of those, that's the last time they changed the underlying code for tomorrow. Right. Yeah, they'll be going through. Yeah, and so at, just as an example, um, I got to talk to the uh, the the person who's managing the uh, SLS flight software, um, which is again just the the core stage and boosters. And then again, like ICPS has its own flight and navigation system. Orion has its own flight and navigation system. Um, but yeah, they have they. They are running on release 14 for Artemis 1, and they are also doing simultaneous development of release 15, which will be mm -hmm. for Artemis 2. And then release oh. 16 will be when they get to the Block 1B vehicle. Very cool. Yeah. And uh, actually, as we've been streaming about 15 minutes ago or so, uh, NASA has announced they've had the call to stations for Artemis 1, uh, which essentially means right. that the launch team has arrived in the launch control center, and they're getting ready to we'll start the countdown. And the countdown should start in about 15 minutes, and we'll discuss that a bit more as we get closer to it. Um, but Chris, you did, or, or Philip, you did mention uh, Artemis 2, and uh, Zolwick here in chat is asking uh, for Philip, if all goes well, when can we expect Artemis 2? Is there like a firm countdown date? Does it rely on Artemis 1 launching on time? How, how are we looking for Artemis 2? It does rely on Artemis, on the timing of Artis, Artemis 1, because there are some physical electronics in the Orion crew module that will, that will be the only piece of hardware that returns from this mission intact um, that they will remove from that when it returns to Kennedy Space Center and they will then install it in the Artemis II Orion crew module. And so right now, um, I would say you can't, it, it, it would be difficult to narrow down, um, narrow it down any more than the second half of 2024 is probably a realistic kind of time frame. Um, I think once, because there's a dependency on art on when this mission launches, um, once it finally flies, then I think it will become easier for NASA to to firm up schedules um, on that. But um, one of the things here is that the Orion, you know, as we've been saying, but I guess to, just to be more explicit, the Orion for Artemis II is a a full vehicle which has a full life support system in it, um, and it, so it's a superset of the functionality that that is in the spacecraft that's on the pad here. Uh, and so it, that, that is almost a first flight, um, in and of itself. And Orion 
the Ryan program decided to split their test program up into three missions. So we had the EFT-1 mission, which was at the way back at the end of 2014. We have this mission, and then we have Artemis-2. Uh, for the for the rest for SLS they they decided to sort of baseline the vehicle um, with this first this, this single test flight and it it won't be uh, the the differences between the vehicle are more things like the flight software that we were talking about but it's it's a very SLS will not change nearly as much from Artemis one to Artemis two as Orion will. Gotcha. And uh, another, qu- actually a personal question I've been thinking, do you think we're going to see some, you know, continuous delays like we saw with Artemis 1 when Artemis 2 comes around? So say like, you know, the six month delay, the one year delay, or do you think now that SLS is kind of a, quote unquote, a real rocket and that by the time Artemis 2 is getting ready, it's going to have flown. Do you think we're going to see those annoying delays or do you think with Artemis 2, it's going to pretty much stick with the schedule? <laughs> uh, I guess, uh, it depends yeah. on what you define as an annoying delay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No. Yeah. It's like yeah. a five day delay is if a five day delay is annoying to somebody, then we, we might see a few of those, but like, yeah, a, a, a six month delay. I hope not. Um, but okay. yeah. like just I as mean, an example, uh, I'm sorry, Chris, let me, let me just throw this in here just yeah, to yeah, just yeah, yeah. illustrate. Go, go yeah. Um, the, the core stage was the, was the critical path item for this, uh, launch. And, uh, so basically, it sort of was the trailer of all the hardware, the last big piece of hardware to get into Kennedy. Um, the 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 second one is we were talking about a possible launch in the second half of 2024. Well, Core Stage Two that will support that launch could be ready to go to Kennedy by March of next year. So it it could be wow. it could sit it could sit in storage for possibly all the for a year before it's ready to be stacked. So in terms of, you know, SLS is, is definitely uh, getting more mature in terms of their production and operations. Um, It's still in development, but you know, they're obviously producing vehicles and we're, this is a, this is a, an operation. Um, And so even though it's a first time operation they're they've gotten, a lot of operational experience, especially in the last half year. And so it should go a little more smoothly, but yeah, we're still going to see a few days here and there. I'm sure. I'm sorry, Chris. No, 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 no. That that, that was perfect. The only thing I would add to that is just to bear in mind too, that some things are out of their control, right? Some things they do control, like, like what actually happens with the vehicle while they're working on it and building it. But things like they can't control, like they can't control hurricanes coming into new, to, coming into the New Orleans area where the core stage is built. They can't help that. And we have seen uh, in past programs that that can have a pretty significant effect if a major hurricane does strike the production facility. Um, so just bear in mind, too, like some of the delays will definitely be technical. I mean, we're way too far out for there not to be some type of a delay in rocketry. That would be mm-hmm. almost unheard of at this point. But, but also bear in mind, some things are just not going to be within their control like the weather. Um, so if something like that were to happen, that would hold up Artemis too. Just, just remember that's not their fault um, or, or anyone's issue, you know, anyone's fault on that one. And they'll just deal with it and go where they can. Very cool. Uh, now we're going to dive into uh, exactly what we're going to be looking at for the countdown clocks. It's about to start in about 10 minutes. Uh, but first I want to thank some people who supported oh, yeah. us through this live stream. Uh, Let's 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 stay optimistic here. Uh, oh, the ca- the count the count will start whether or not the multi digital display device that's yeah, also exactly. a clock I'm will we're switch over see is now ah. a different question. Yeah, because <laughs> has really just stayed at Artemis, uh, and I was expecting to at least see static numbers right now. So we'll see. Yeah, that's what I was hoping for. Yeah, but anyway, we're gonna see hopefully in the next few minutes. Uh, but first off, uh, Pim Blocker and Ken Mackey, thank you for becoming two Capcom members. We hope you enjoy the uh, the Discord access that comes with that, as well as John Maun, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, a new Padrat member. And uh, Matthias Ray, thanks for becoming a Launch Director member. That is some serious support. We appreciate that. Oh, wow. Thank you. And thank yeah, you. Same, same with T- Douglas TJ, Launch Director member as well. Thank you very much for you, too. That thank really, you. really helps out with what we're doing here. Um, now, Matias here uh, with a 200 uh, ARS um, Argentinian. I'm not too sure on what that. Oh, yeah, there we go. They're saying, hello, everyone. Greetings from Argentina. Uh, here's a space fanatic. They hug everyone. 
Uh, sorry if they didn't <laughs> understand part or if they already told, uh, but is there no launch today? Well, there's no SLS right. launch today. Chris, <laughs> I think a little birdie told me there is a launch today. Well, weather permitting, yes, there is a Starlink launch at, I believe it is still 10.22 p.m. local time off of Pad 40 uh, from the Cape. And yes, we will be broadcasting it. Yes, we will be here covering it. Um, so yeah, we will be here uh, uh, covering Starlink later tonight um, and then ready for Artemis just, uh, yeah, ready for Artemis like 36 hours later. Definitely. Uh, thank you very much, Matthias. We appreciate that support. And uh, nine, uh, <laughs> 0.99 euros here from the U.S. Space Force. Thank you very much, Space Force. We know Mesh, we appreciate that. And Brett Newbert here with $5 saying, is anything from this mission going to the moon itself? So I assume they mean landing or just orbiting. Well, that's pretty good yes. to say. Oh, go ahead, Chris. Yes, at least one of the CubeSats will enter lunar orbit from Lockheed Martin. Uh, so at least one element of this will enter a more, it's not like a, it will, will enter a lunar orbit and Orion is technically in an orbit as well. It will complete one and a half orbits, um, of the moon in its distant retrograde configuration before, uh, doing the deorbit burn at the moon to come back to earth. And I did not misspeak. The deorbit burn is at the moon. <laughs> wow. That's really, yep. really weird. I'm, ex I'm so excited. Again, yeah. cube, there's so much to talk about. The CubeSats that are riding along with this. This is not just an Orion mission. It's a scientific mission, too, because of all the CubeSats. But yeah, that's something to discuss yep. for our Artemis streams. Um, anyway, thank you, Brett. We appreciate that. And Swayam Sarthak here. Thanks for becoming a PadRat member. We appreciate your support there. Enjoy the emojis in chat. And Arthur Watson, a new member, PadRat as well. Thank you very much. And Jerwa has gifted 20 red team memberships. Uh, Jerwa, Ooh, a nice. regular in chat here. Thank you very much for all that support. Uh, again, gifting memberships is a great way to support us. And it's gifted to the most, some of the most active people who are in chat at that point. Um, and of course, we've gone on before, but our membership program is a great way to support the work that we do because the cameras you're looking at here, all the remote setup gear, everything like that is pricey. And so we really appreciate all the support through that that are making live streams like this possible, that are really making this whole weekend of just insanity of Artemis streams possible. And I think we should talk a little bit later about what we're planning to do this weekend. But um, thank you, Jerwa. I appreciate that. And uh, one last one here from Morf saying uh, with five pounds saying with the u2 i believe they're mean wb57 taking aerial footage of the launch will it catch stage separation on film uh it will get srb separation um but uh the core stage will be way too far downrange at that point um when it when it cuts off and separates um the core stage will be well over a thousand kilometers downrange at at miko main engine cutoff and stage separation so it'll get srb set but i know it won't get core stage Gotcha. And it looks like the countdown clock has turned off, which yes, which might mean it's might mean it's moving. It might mean my buddy is pushing the buttons up there. <laughs> uh, hopefully. Right. Uh, so just and, like just as a, uh, a a situational awareness thing, which I'm kind of a I'm kind of a geek for. But um, what they call to stations is sort of the formal beginning of the countdown operation. Um, and so we've been kind of getting mixed messages from public affairs about whether the countdown technically starts at call to stations, which was back at 9.53 a.m. Eastern, um, or whether it starts when the countdown clock starts. But that's what we're looking for here is uh, the countdown clock starting. And the, the convention that they used uh, during the wet dress rehearsal was to start the clock 30 minutes after call to stations. And so uh, just to, again, to give some perspective here, for the rollout back on the night of August 16th, they they started rolling you know, an hour late. They were planning on starting at midnight, but the call to stations for the rollout operation was several hours before. I think if I recall correctly, it may have been as early as like 4 p.m. local before, or maybe 6 p.m. local for a first motion at midnight. So, you know, the oper the all of these operations have, you know, funny uh, alphanumeric uh, uh, notations for them but um for the countdown that's the convention they used in shuttle was the call stations and then 30 minutes later the clock would start gotcha and yeah we should be about less than five minutes away if everything 
holds accordingly. Uh, and yeah, hopefully we get a nice visual there. But either way, it'll be nice to kind of mark the occasion as, you know, kind of christening the countdown as starting. Um, but very And first cool. launch count on this pad since 2009. Unbelievable. Right. Yeah, think about that. The last launch was Ares 1X. Uh, Ares 1, one of my favorite rockets, one of the best rockets. <laughs> I kid. Where's that, Thomas? That's... Yeah, exactly. Where's Thomas when you need him? <laughs> um, but yeah, Pad 39B has sat vacant pretty much for the past 10 past 10 years past 13 years really mm -hmm. um excluding construction and things like that but this is the first you know real launch vehicle to sit on 39b and that's just yes. strange in my mind to hear any thoughts on that chris yeah. i i mean i i mean it was a long road to get from to get from there to here uh, with where we are and uh, but i mean to see b back in action and also, I think what means more to me isn't, isn't just that Pad B hasn't been used in a while, hasn't been used in 13 years to launch a rocket. Um, it's, it's that Pad B only launched one lunar flight during the Apollo program. Mm -hmm. It launched the dress rehearsal on Apollo 10. And that was it. Uh, it never launched another Saturn V. It never launched anything else to the moon. It was used at the, toward the tail end of the Saturn Apollo programs for the smaller Saturn 1B flights to Skylab and the Apollo Soyuz test mission. So, I mean, it has history to it. Um, and then, of course, it hosted 54 shuttle launches or 53 shuttle launches off of it um, as well. So, I mean, the pad has history, but it's more the fact that what it was originally built for, it only did once. And this is only the second time it's going to do what it was actually built and designed by Von Braun and his teams all those years ago to do. Um, but the other thing that I will point out here, too, is that as part of the Artemis program with, with, with SpaceX constructing the launch tower for Starship, both 39A and 39B are, reconfigured, are being configured again for major super heavy lift vehicles. This is Von Braun's dream coming yes. true. Um, and that's what means more to me about it, to see it out there as we begin count operations, which should be any minute now. Yeah. And yeah, you're right. There's we're getting the pad, the 39 pads are getting back into super heavy lift, but with two extremely different launch vehicles in pretty much every yeah. regard. But at the same time, these two vehicles will be working together and both absolutely essential for getting the next humans back to the moon. And yeah, and and on so those exciting. two pads, yeah, and on those two pads, right? SpaceX has A, but then you see on B, you see Lockheed Martin, the European Space Agency, United Launch Alliance, Boeing. Northrop Grumman and NASA, and you put all of those together, you've got the biggest players in the industry who are actively flying right now, all working together to 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 get this done. And that's also incredibly meaningful, too. Yeah. And I was even thinking while you were talking that all three pads in Complex 39, so A, B, and the Starship pad, all are going to be doing work for the Artemis program because Falcon Heavy is launching yes. Gateway. So yes, yeah, this, exactly. this entire complex, there's no part of this complex that is not actively helping us get back to the moon. Yeah. And we're coming what up here. What they were about... designed to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and we're coming up here on about 30 seconds, it should be, until uh, the countdown <laughs> start. I believe we lost your feet a little bit there, Chris. We're going to wait for that to get back. But right now we're looking at oh, a no. great shot of SLS on pad B. And this is a gorgeous shot. I mean, and again, it's still not clicking in my mind that SLS is on the pad. It's just so exciting right now. I know. Yeah. The clock, <sighs> what, what, the, just one thing to point out, um, the clock uh, does not have an indicator for days. It, it, it shows hours, minutes, and seconds. So what, mm -hmm. we would, what we should be seeing here is the clock at uh, 19 hours, 10 minutes, and that's when it would, uh, would for 43 hours, 10 minutes, um, and counting is when they would pick it up at there to pick it up here. Um, but they, you know, again, we, we might, that we may just see them pick it up when they can get the display up on the, on the countdown clock screen. There, there it is. So, we are counting. We are counting 43 hours, nine minutes, 22 seconds yeah, and counting so, to the, right. There beautiful. you go. Right. We and are so, counting down. So guys, you can add, we on. have, yeah, we have, there's, there's three hours. of Sorry, holds, sorry, sorry. We, we, so, we just need. Sorry, we just need to, oh, yeah. to mark that. Like, we're Absolutely. counting down. Like, for the first it's... time since Apollo 17, 
there is a countdown underway to launch a vehicle to the moon from Launch Complex 39 at the Kennedy Space Center. That is historic. For the first time in 50 years, we're doing it again. Look at that beautiful countdown clock on its way down to T0. And Philip, I know you're going to talk about the, the um, oh, here come some jets. Here come the T-38s. Oh, uh, Chris, we lost your camera. Do you uh, know? Oh, don't know if you heard that, but uh, T-38s are flying. Uh, some jets are flying over us now that we've got the count going as well. So that is good, but uh, but but Philip, you were uh, talking a little bit about the you wanted to talk about the built-in holds because uh, it's a it's a forty-three hour ten minute countdown from the clock standpoint, but that takes forty-six hours and forty minutes to accomplish, correct? Right. Well, so we're 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 basically we're you know we're you know forty-three hours eight minutes and something you know essentially forty-three hours eight minutes on the clock now, and you add three hours to that. Um, the extra 30 minutes, um, again, we were, we were, were sort of being given these mixed messages from public affairs. So they were talk, they were marking the call to stations, which was about half an hour ago. So we're at essentially 46 hour L minus 46 hours, you know, five minutes, give or take. Um, and the, there will be two holds. There's the, the first, they're basically, um, ahead of. Okay, no, they did. So now they have set it up. So they've got the they they're they're putting the twenty four hours on there. So forty. So they've got it. That's nice. It, that that's a little less confusing. So um, the first hold will be at t minus six hours forty minutes, and that's a that's a two hour and thirty minute long hold. And then there's a thirty minute hold when the clock gets to ten minutes. And so those are basically big decision points. Uh, the first one is at at six hours forty minutes. They they will stop the clock, and they will they will look at the weather, and they'll look at the vehicle, and they'll decide whether they're gonna whether they're good to go to tank the vehicle, fill it with propellant, so they can proceed towards a launch. And then at t minus ten minutes, when they stop for thirty minutes, that's their last point to to, to go around to everybody and make sure that they're really ready to fly. So if they give a go to pick up the clock at ten minutes, they're going they they are ready to launch, and and they're basically gonna start the the automatic sequence and and uh at that point hopefully the vehicle just the, the 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 launch sequencer counts the vehicle down to ignition and then the vehicle takes over and flies to orbit and then eventually onto the moon awesome and yet uh we apologize for the uh, the loss of feed there earlier we had a uh Right as the countdown is about to start, we lost cell service on Chris's camera for just about a minute there. Uh, it happened right at the worst time, so that was uh, very inconvenient. But we apologize for that. Um, and while we're looking here at the clock, I actually uh, had a question here in chat from Michael S. asking, when did they replace the original kind of shuttle countdown timer that had, you know, a typical LED clock display? Uh, Chris, when did that happen? Because this one's a brand new, you know, digital display where they can put fancy colors on there. But there used to be one that was just numbers. Oh, I believe we don't have Chris uh, on. Nope, talking. No, talking while muted. Talking while muted. Um, <laughs> no, um, <laughs> it 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 was replaced shortly after the end of the shuttle program, and it is currently at the entrance to the visitor center complex. Um, is where it is, and they switched over to this. Uh, it's technically a multi digital. It's technically a multi display digital device or something like that that can sometimes also function as just a clock, which it is doing right now. Gotcha. Very cool. And again, it's great to see that ticking down. Like you said, the mission is counting down. And that's still not fully clicked in my head. And I don't think it really will till tomorrow night. But yeah, they are counting down to Artemis right now. Unbelievable. And while we're talking about like the whole countdown and everything, let's kind of go to the elephant in the room. When exactly are they launching Artemis one? When does the launch window open on Monday? Yeah, great question. So it is a two hour launch window on Monday, it opens at 833 and zero seconds on the dot. Uh, local time, which is uh, 123300 UTC, and it closes two hours later, so 10.33 a.m. local time uh, here at Kennedy, and 14.33 um, UTC is when the launch window closes. They can launch at any second within that launch window. There are no cutouts within the window that we know of. There might, on the day, be cutouts to like avoid other satellites in orbit, depending on the trajectory and the timing of all of that, but 
in general, they have available to them the entire two hour window um, and can launch at any second therein. So uh, that's sort of that. If they are not off the ground on Monday, if either weather or a technical issue or something pops up that they're not comfortable with completely, um, if something does pop up on that side of things, their backup opportunity moves to September 2nd. Um, and that has to do with not just replenishing the fueling commodities at Pad B, but there's also a two day cut out for the Orion, where Orion would basically be in shadow for too long based on Earth moon alignment if it launched on those days for its solar arrays. Um, so they can't launch on those two days because of an Orion constraint. And then they come back on the backside of that on September 2nd. They have that as a potential launch day. And then if they're still not off the ground on September 2nd, they stand down for the third and fourth to redo the liquid oxygen and liquid uh, hydrogen commodities at the launch pad. And then the final day of the window would be September 5th. Now, the launch times do move. And Philip, off the top of my head, I cannot remember the opening of the window times for the second and the fifth. Do you happen to have those in front of you? I do. And I'll, let me just add yeah. that um, the, the the launch period, so the, the actual celestial mechanics, um, give them through September 6th. Um, they've, and, and I, I, you know, I think it's, it's still unclear how they're going to manage that. If we get there, I think everybody's hoping that we just launch on Monday and we don't have to worry about September, but the, if the, the September 2nd opportunity, the window would open at uh, 1248 PM Eastern time, which is, let's see, that would be 1648, uh, UTC. And that's a, again, a, a two hour long launch window on September 5th. It, it you can see it keeps getting later and later. Um, on September fifth, the launch window opens at five twelve p.m. Eastern, so that's seventeen twelve p.m., which would be I believe twenty one twelve uh, UTC, and that's a ninety minute long window. And so the 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 fifth and sixth the the the, the two opportunities at the beginning and the end of this launch period, which it actually opened on the twenty third of August, and it goes through the September sixth. Um, are a little shorter than two hours. Um, so, you know, if we get there, so for instance, if if they were to be able to use the September 6th opportunity, that launch window is only 24 minutes long and that window would open at 6.57 p.m. Eastern. So, and that would actually, let's see, that would, would be 22.57, I think, UTC on the 6th. So, um, and so, you know, if if they can't make it on Monday, the the earliest opportunity the 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 earliest next opportunity is September second, but then depending on how they negotiate with other people in the range like SpaceX, um, maybe they can use a different maybe they can use a different day. So if for instance if they get to the, I think September second's a Friday. If you know if the weather just looks horrible um, when they come in on on uh, early Friday morning or late Thursday night, and they don't and they and and they think they have a better chance on the third, for instance, they might opt to wait 24 hours if that's an option on the range. Um, and then you know if uh, they also in theory have the ability to do a 48 hour scrub turnaround um, if they only replenish the liquid hydrogen commodity. So let's say for instance they came in on the second. Um, the weather held them for whatever reason, and they scrubbed um, and let you know again a weather they don't they don't have as much of a, a troubleshooting issue to do with if there's a, just a weather if there's just a weather scrub. Um, in theory, they could try and come back on the fourth, but again, we would have to they, we'd, we'd have to see whether the range would be able to support that. But they may have some flexibility um, between September second and September sixth about when they could try. All right. Awesome. And we're going to run through some super chats here because we have a few building up uh, from the inhabitant of LC31 <laughs> saying, oh, no, saying that technical delays are never annoying. I know what that means, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, yeah. The, don't the, wanna... the old adage, you, you don't want to be flying wishing you were on the ground. You'd rather be on the ground wishing yep. you were flying. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And that's why, you know, in the end, it's not bad that things have taken their time to get here because you know, you don't want to mess things up, especially with something as big as Artemis one. It's not like a routine, say like routine comsat flight or something. This is the all up test flight to the moon without people on board, but still there's a lot riding on this mission and you don't want to rush yourself for the sake of rushing yourself. But yeah, yeah lots I of mean, lessons have been learned. Oh, go ahead, Philip. 
I was just going to say, with the exception of the Orion crew module, this is the first flight of everything else. So SLS, mm -hmm. we, we've, we've been running story. We just ran a story from Adrian about the European service module. This is the first flight of the European service module, too. Um, and then also the the entire you know the the other piece of Orion is the crew module adapter that uh, you know the, the name as it sounds it's it's it it sort of functions in between the ESM and the and the crew module, but that's the first flight for that part of the Orion too. So it isn't just SLS flying for the first time. Even though ICPS is a derivative of the Delta IV upper stage, this is a first flight for that. Uh, for that stage as well. So this is really it's an all up first flight. It's it's you know, close to the Apollo four, uh, Apollo four um, mission that 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 is kind of an analog for what we'll, we'll hopefully be seeing on Monday. Gotcha, very cool. Um, and Dragon Trapper here uh, saying with the ten dollar super chat thoughts on people uh, who hope that Artemis one fails. Uh, I just say that they're being very pessimistic. You know, you got to enjoy everything about spaceflight. You know, that's that's my two cents there. Yeah, and I would also turn around and ask them why they're against going back to the moon. That would be yeah. my honest answer. If you want yeah. SLS to fail, then you're not on board with going back to the moon, and I'd really like to know why. Absolutely. And I mean, there are valid criticisms of the SLS program, but at the end of the day, it's here. We've gotten here. Let's enjoy it, you know? Let's let's not just sit and, you know, complain. we got to enjoy what we have, and we're going back to the moon. I think maybe it's just me, but yeah. that's something that I yeah. enjoy. Yeah, you know? I, I mean, I mean, like, this is the start of that moment, right, where, like, in our lifetimes, right, like, there's a good chance we'll be able to look up one night at the moon and see the lights from our bases shining mm -hmm. back at us. And that gives me really good feels. But and this is the start of it. This is the absolute start of it right here. And yes, all, all, always possible that the vehicles involved with this will change. Almost certainly that the vehicles involved in this will change, right? Because we're not talking about just going back for sortie missions. We're going. We're talking about going back to stay. That requires a long-term commitment. And look at the International Space Station. The vehicles servicing it have changed in some ways on the U.S. side radically since it was designed, right? So that doesn't mean the vehicles won't change. But this is how it starts. So. Be on board with it. <laughs> if you want to go back to yeah. the moon and Mars, be on board with it. Like exactly. It might not just be a little optimistic, you know, because this is exciting. This is a huge rocket. It's something so large we really haven't seen anything this powerful since Falcon Heavy or the Space Shuttle, one of those. But it's like since the space this, shuttle. Yeah, this is a huge rocket. It's gonna be loud. It's gonna be cool. The pictures, they're gonna be my phone background for the next few months. Oh it, yeah. It's, yeah. It's it's gonna be great and it's going to get the, it's one of the big things too that's been going through my mind this is going to get space flight back into the public eye because up until now it's been you know like a little news coverage of say like inspiration four or the most recent cargo or the most recent crew dragon mission but this is nasa going back to the moon with their rocket this, this is, is nasa and about. isa and canada yes right now all going back to the moon jaxa is involved as well um, yes. Although their their participation comes a little bit later with, with the gateway and everything, but th this is not just NASA. This is mm -hmm. the world. This is this is all the member. Th this is you know the, all the major players that you've heard about that have contributed, you know, financially or technology to it. But this is also Australia and Brazil and Argentina and the United Arab Emirates and countries that have never gone with us or have only sent yes. like one or two astronauts before. This is the this is the vast. This is a good portion of the world saying we're doing this together and mad props for Jim Bridenstine for setting that up because that is his legacy with all of this is yes. making the overall program indispensable with the international cooperation. Yeah, that just for a second, if I might add, that was beyond brilliant move by Jim. He knew exactly what he needed to do to make Artemis not become a Constellation 2.0. And he should absolutely be one of the big legacies of the Artemis program. Um, but yeah, it's so exciting. And by the end of this decade, if things hold out, there should be Europeans walking on the moon. There may be Japanese astronauts walking on the moon or at least flying around the moon. This is not, like you said, this is not just America going, you know, America competing with like a foreign entity like we had back during the space race. This is America and allies going to the moon together. There's going to be a Canadian flying by the moon on Artemis 2. This is beyond exciting and it's going to advance it's going to advance science globally in ways that we we, we don't even know yet so 
I don't know, a little end end rant there, but that that's that's just something to put it in perspective, I guess. Um, and Hef Williams here with the eight dollar Australian saying that there is no faking this SLS is happening. Absolutely, it's so exciting to see this happen. Thank you very much, Hef. We appreciate that. Um, and Rorsach, uh, thank you for becoming a red team member. We really much appreciate that. Um, and Kyle Cords, thanks for upgrading your membership to Capcom. We hope you enjoy the Discord access that you get with Capcom. I'm sure it's going to be extremely busy and extremely exciting as we come up on Artemis Roll 1. A bunch of people discussing that. Uh, and Johan Roman, thanks for being a launch director member. Um, and Saturn Man, thank you for the, I believe, Norwegian Crones. 55 of those. We appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. But this is so exciting. We've got the countdown clock going. And um, I got and Snoopy for... just walked into frame there, too. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> oh, okay, there you go. Uh, okay. Yes. The Whoa, Snoopy cat. Yeah, he's Snoopy got his launch and well. entry suit on. Yep, Snoopy is sort of the mascot that they're using, the Snoopy caps and everything from Apollo. Um, yeah, so the Snoopy mascot. He's the is zero G indicator, too. Yeah, he's, yep, exactly. That is awesome. And I love all of the, uh, you know, the, the characters flying with this. I mean, I grew up with watching Shaun the Sheep. And, you know, there's a figurine of Shaun the Sheep flying here. Snoopy, I grew up watching that. Now that's flying here. So that's cool to watch. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, any more questions for us, Ian? Yeah, I'm looking through right now, and actually a really good one here that I've been thinking about. Uh, what are our opinions on kind of how it's going to fly off the pad? So Phil here is asking, do you think SLS will leap off the pad similar to Shuttle or be more, you know, taking its time like the Saturn V? Do we have any, uh, any yeah. actual firm data or any thoughts on that? Yes. Uh, yeah, we do. Uh, it, has the, it has basically the same thrust to weight ratio as the Shuttle did at liftoff, so mm -hmm. it will leave the pad very, very quickly. Uh, it will clear the tower after about five or six seconds and begin the roll pitch and yaw program at seven seconds into flight. So it will book it out of there just like the shuttle did. Yep. Awesome. That's going to be so exciting to see and to see it roll. I've seen in the animations, it does a pretty, pretty hefty roll program. I can't yep. wait to everything about this flight is getting so exciting to me. The onboard cameras, everything. But yeah, so exciting. And, Amanda. and when you see 300 feet leave the pad, <laughs> Like, oh. like that quickly, like that is, that is impressive. Yeah. This, we're up in the, up in the next coming year, we're going to be seeing so many large rockets fly. We're going to see, you know, Falcon Heavy kind of quote unquote return to service and never really stood down. Uh, we're going to see Delta IV Heavy launch. We're going to see SLS is made in flight. We're going to see Starship Super Heavy orbital flight. So many big rockets coming up. And I want more, honestly. I'm, 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 I'm greedy. I want all the big rockets. Um, but a question here from Ian Stubbington, a nice first name there, saying, will the escape tower be active on this mission even though it's uncrewed? That's a very good question. Uh, Philip, uh, what's the escape tower going to be doing on this mission? Is it just you know a dummy or is it actually there it's, to control the flight? The, the, the launch abort system actually serves two purposes for Orion. So it is, it's essentially a payload fairing, um, an aerodynamic fairing, and, and then it's also... Uh, can be used as an abort system. But on every launch, just like on EFT-1 back in 2014, the uh, there is a jettison motor on the launch abort system tower, and it will pull the it will pull the fairing away from Orion about three minutes and change after liftoff. So the jettison motor is active, but then the abort functions are are inactive for this vehicle because it's an uncrewed vehicle. Gotcha. Very cool. And um, one last question here from Kevin saying, will Orion be the largest thing the U.S. has put in orbit around the moon since 1972? And I think we could kind of cut off the end of that because Orion is the largest thing we're ever putting in orbit of the moon, period, right? That's a good question. I'm not That's sure. a good question. Because remember, it, we it, the Saturn V delivered the, the command service module and the lunar module um you know on a tli trajectory so we would need to, we'd need to go check the numbers on that it this is a bit this is a big this is a big vehicle it's i think it's it's approximately 27 metric tons to that translunar injection um that's that's what sls is going to deliver um on that trajectory to the moon very cool 
And thank you for the question, Kevin. And thank you to everyone for the question. So uh, now we have the countdown clock running. We are counting down actively to Artemis 1. The teams are on station in the launch control center. The vehicle is on the pad. Uh, and over the coming hours and the coming days, they're going to be powering on different components, testing different components, getting things ready for launch to ensure that they're going to be ready by Monday morning at 8.33 a.m. Uh, now that's going to bring us to the end of our live stream here, but don't worry, that's not the end of our live streams for Artemis 1, and if you're really aching for some extra Artemis content, we have our 24-7 Artemis Stakeout live stream that just began a few minutes ago with some live streams on the, of the pad, and oh boy, right as I'm saying this, we got a huge super chat from Robert Hobson with $200 saying wow. the NSF crew needs to get selfies with Snoopy or look be <laughs> a sad panda. Wow. Thank <laughs> you very much, Robert. That means so much. We know you're a regular with the super chats. And again, we, we appreciate all of them. But thank you so much for all of this support that you've done for us. And uh, yeah, that is unbelievable. Thank you so much, Robert. That's going to come a huge way in future productions. So thank you so much, as well as Mark Davis becoming a Capcom member and John O'Connor with $5 uh, with a quick question saying, will the vehicle be able to take images of the moon, Earth, etc.? And they'd love to yes. see uh, images. So yes, yes, it'll be taking videos, images, and all of that. Selfies. It'll Orion's yeah. going to take some selfies. Yes, and I'm yep. sure we're going to discuss all the camera angles we're going to see on the coming live stream. But thank you to everyone who supported us this stream through memberships and super chats, especially Robert. Again, thank you so much for all of that. And thanks to everyone who has questions and tuned in. Um, but for now, we're going to be tossing it over to our 24-7 Artemis live stream. And we hope you enjoy. And we hope everyone here enjoys that over the coming weekend with some great views of SLS on the pad. So uh, we're going to be signing off from now. Um, thank you very much, Chris, for being out in the field and giving us uh, all these camera views. We really appreciate that, Chris. My absolute pleasure. Awesome. And Philip, our SLS, well, not even the SLS expert, pretty much. Thank you for tuning in as well and giving us some uh, great information on what to expect in the coming days. Yep, looking forward to it. We're not far away now. Awesome. As well as Patrick in the studio controlling for us. And uh, I'm Ian Atkinson with NASA Spaceflight. Uh, we thank you all for tuning in. We hope you enjoy uh, our coming content in the next few days. Um, and enjoy the 24-7 Artemis Stakeout stream. We'll be sending you guys there. And we hope you uh, have a great rest of your day. And we'll see you tonight, should things hold for a Starlink launch. Have a great night, every Have a great rest of your day, everybody.